O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. This morning, our Advent observance began with one of my all-time favorite hymns, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending. And I love that hymn. It's a personal favorite of mine, actually, and may it be a long time from now, but if that hymn were to be at my funeral, I would be okay with it. <laughs> I think it's partly my favorite, one of my favorite hymns because it was written by the Methodist hymn writer Charles Weston, who was a, and that was part of my upbringing in the United Methodist Church. And so it takes significance for me because it's one of those places of overlap between my previous tradition and this one. And it helps me to imagine a fuller sense of communion with Episcopalians and Methodists, some brighter day in the future. It's also a favorite because it supports the traditional view of Advent. I, I had to go back in my previous edition where it read, it supports the right view of Advent, but I, I struck that, that was <laughs> the traditional view. Uh, along with our colleague for the day, and the readings for the day, this hymn also foretells a coming day of judgment. And this hymn makes clear to us that Advent is not a countdown to Christmas. We have a calendar in our house that some call the Advent calendar, but it starts on December 1st. It's a Christmas countdown calendar, not an Advent calendar. And it's green and red. Whereas we wear blue in Advent because it's the color of the sky just before the dawn. And yes, so many of us are simultaneously preparing for our elaborate celebrations of Christmas. But thematically, Advent is not primarily or even secondarily a season about waiting or anticipating or expecting the birth of Jesus. It's about watching for his return in glory, his coming again on clouds descending. So in Advent we look not for a baby in a manger, we look for the final triumph of the exalted king and his thousand saints attending, as Wesley put it. Advent is not a season of pregnancy that leads to Christmas, the labor and delivery date. It's pretty simple. Jesus was already born. And so it's bizarre to anticipate a thing that has already happened. Jesus was born. And the incarnation of God is part of our present reality now. God incarnates into you and me. And God reveals God's self through our neighbors. And that is a present reality for us. And so what we wait for is a bit different. What we have expectancy for, what we prepare ourselves for, what we are longing for in Advent is not the celebration of the birth of Jesus, but the triumphal re-entry of the King. Advent is about looking for his coming again in great power and glory. The idea of an apocalyptic culminating event has always been part of Christianity. Jesus talked about it often. So whether we call it Judgment Day or whether we 
call it the second coming. It's always been there. And I think that we ignore this part of our tradition to our own peril. When we do not honor this part of the Christian tradition, we are missing out on a major component of our faith. Judgment Day is not something we talk about a lot. It might make us a little squeamish. It might make us feel uncomfortable. And so we might just avoid it or reject it or chalk it up to one of the crazy parts of the Bible, right? <laughs> but what if we tried to understand what was under it? And what if coming to an understanding of Judgment Day actually brought us a sense of peace? The American scholar of early Christianity, Christian Brady, writes that Americans often don't know what to do with the tradition of apocalypticism because we are scared off by the idea of judgment. It makes us very uncomfortable. But on the other hand, it should set us at ease. Brady invites us to see Judgment Day instead as God's Justice Day. A day when all that's wrong with the world gets finally set right. He suggests that dropping the theme of judgment in middle-class American faith re reflects our privilege and our disconnect from the poor. Unless we have personally been the victim of some kind of oppression or wrongful suffering or injustice, we may not have the empathy we would need to ache for the ills of the world to be healed. We may not fully internalize the bones deep urgency of the need in this world for justice. He invites us to see that when the church ignores the theme of judgment, we ignore the cry of the homeless, of the poor, of the earth. And as a church, we fail to provide spiritual hospitality to the victims of violence and oppression and every sort of degradation. So what if instead of being squeamish about Judgment Day, we embraced it, we looked forward to it? What if we saw Judgment Day as a hopeful sign, a hopeful sign that the things of this world will indeed pass away and that God will indeed restore the creation to its intended fulfillment under the banner of King Jesus? that he will indeed wipe away every tear, and that indeed there will be no more sighing or sadness. The Hill family yesterday decorated a Christmas tree before Advent even started. <laughs> It was literally the only free weekend on the family calendar until mid-January, which is itself a bit of an indictment. A previous version of me would have judged me for making Christmas preparations before Advent has even gotten started. That version of me thought that Advent was a season of preparation for Christmas and not for Judgment Day. But over the years, I have left that version of myself behind, and I've come to see that Advent and Christmas preparations can happen concurrently because they have little impact on one another, and they're two very different things, even if they're happening at the same time. Because culturally, we have made the celebration of Christmas something 
so elaborate that it takes weeks of preparation, it would be practically impossible to be prepared for it without doing some of the work during Advent, right? So I don't worry about this anymore. Because now I see that Christmas and Advent are two separate observances that can occur simultaneously. It's not a linear path from one to the other. One need not become, come prior to the other. Advent preparation has nothing at all to do with getting a tree up or getting your Christmas card list organized. Those are Christmas preparations happening during Advent. <laughs> Instead, Advent has everything to do with learning to ache in your bones about what's going on in the world around us. It has everything to do with being aware of the plight of the poor and those who suffer as a result of injustices and the abuses of power we see in this world. Observing Advent and getting ready for that means doing as much as we can to join our hearts and minds together with the voices of those who are crying out in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, or perhaps said a bit differently, Jesus, hurry up. We've been wandering in this wilderness for too long. Rescue us from this violent and hateful wilderness we have made. There is too much dishonesty, and it has too much authority. Jesus, hurry up. Come back soon so that the poorest children won't have to celebrate Christmas with nothing again. Jesus, hurry up. Sort us out. We are on a crash course. It is, Maine, it is winter in Maine and there are hundreds of homeless people who need more than a blanket and, a sh and shelter. They need policies to prevent homelessness from ever happening in the first place. Jesus, hurry up and may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. This is the longing of our hearts of Advent. And as we long, we can also prepare to celebrate Christmas at the same time. So deck the halls but also pray for the halls of justice to roll down like mighty waters. Amen. Amen.